You are listening to the Overwatch League Network, the podcast with Deadeye on all the Overwatch League news and information, the show with Tactical Visor on the statistics and analysis. Here are your hosts, Totally Drunk, Spider, and Slambo. What is up, guys, and welcome back to Overwatch League Network, the podcast with Deadeye on all the latest Overwatch League news, information, and esports analysis. I am your host, Tumbly Drunk, and tonight on episode 110, we are going to continue uh, as we do our power rankings. Tonight, we'll be going through the teams that we have ranked in the top 10, going from rank number 10 and up to rank number six so next week we'll have our top five uh, and of course you know we got to talk about you know the latest off-season news that we did have and there is a little bit of news this past week so before we jump into the agenda for tonight and introduce you to my co-host i just want to take him up to thank everyone who is joining us tonight on twitch for our live show and that even includes ed who is saying that we're all nerds in all caps because that's the only way that he knows how to type uh, so, I want to thank all of our repeat losers out there as well. So, joining me tonight, as always, we do have the full crew up first. Uh, of course, we have Anura. Anura, welcome back. Good to see you. How's your week been? Uh, it's good to be back. Week's been good. Um, been waiting to do these rankings. Uh, just been hanging out with family, so it's been a good time. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And, uh, Booger, good to have you back after what was a, uh, a decent night of comp. Yeah, we had some good games, and I played a ton yesterday. I've been get, trying to get practiced up because I do not want to go into game night looking like a slob. Yeah, what, what Booger is not mentioning is the fact that I benched him off of main tank. <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing that happened. I don't discriminate against things. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, like you, you and I really, really didn't care what role we were doing, but, like, a right heart just kept sh getting shatter to shatter, and I was like, well, we're running Arissa, and it just kept going through, and then we 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 just kind of, like, took over from there, which actually worked out pretty well at, at that point, uh, so I, I don't know if that's going to be our move going forward, but, you know, we'll, we'll figure that out, we'll see how the next night goes on that front, uh, so it's been a pretty busy week of off-season, uh, in regards to off-season news, we do have a couple of roster changes, which we'll probably touch up on later, primarily because some of the new sign-ins revolve around teams that we are going to have ranked 10 through number 6. Uh, so rather than going over that now, let's talk about what has been going on. So we got a couple uh, of new skins that are available in-game, one of which is available right now, one of which is launching uh, along with the season start. And, you know, the Overwatch League is looking to commemorate everyone's favorite past meta within the game with a new skin. So, Brigida is getting a GOAT skin, uh, of course, to commemorate the 3-3 meta that dominated the Overwatch League this past season for three stages. And, uh, bored the Philadelphia Fusion to tears, essentially, on stage. Uh, so the skin is going to be available starting February 6th, but will be vaulted on February 19th. So this is a limited run skin, uh, so get it while you can. So I'm assuming this is going to fall in line with what we have seen with these other special skins for the League, similar to, like, the Jonek MVP skin, as well as, like, the London Spitfire Championship skin, which was that Flying Ace Winston skin. And that one cost 200 tokens, so... More than likely, it's going to cost the same, but it, it definitely removes kind of like that neutral toned uh, armor uh, coloring for more, of a more like a white, purple, and blue design overall. Now, we don't know whether or not this legendary skin is going to have any sort of uh, voice line variations or anything kind of like that with, like, say, some of the Hanzo, like, wolf skins. Uh, so we'll have to see on that front, but, you know, I... Obviously, there is a new event going on right now, and uh, when I looked at the event skins, and then I saw this skin, I was like, what the hell is going on? Because I really like this skin a lot more than everything we got out of the current event. I don't know, guys, how you are feeling, but how do you guys feel about, essentially, what is 
going to be a meme skin within Overwatch to commemorate uh, really a time of the game that people are not very fond of. I think it's cool. I, I like that they're they're doing more and branching out with like Overwatch League related skins. The brick one, the, the new one looks awesome. I'm totally going to get it. And yeah, like I, I, I think that that's just like a, a really good bonus to have like Overwatch League stuff crossing over into the game. Like I got the Winston one, the Flying Ace one right when it come out. So I'm a fan of this kind of content and I'll hope that they just continue to get creative with it and not just like fall into the pattern of MVP skin team skin you know seeing this is kind of cool like slightly different than the ones they've done before and for like the purpose like it's for a comp not like a player or a team so that's really cool and i like to see more of it too going forward it's it's the perfect ending to goats uh <laughs> with this skin i think Brigido, we're not going to see a meta for a little bit at least i hope um but with the ending of goats i really think this skin's gonna gonna show what it meant which is like it is beautiful it's a great skin um i don't want to see it on my team because i don't want to see Brigitte on my team <laughs> um it's like it's it's just a good ending to it to it all uh i think i'm going to get it even though i barely play play brig but um it all depends on the money i have and um how much the things that we're going to talk about next is going to cost but uh if if it all evens out this is definitely going to be one of my favorite skins to come out at least for Brigitte. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, th there was something that happened on social media this past week that when it was happening, basically everyone on Twitter was like, what the F is going on? Because basically all of these Overwatch League teams changed their avatars to birds. And then they all started, like, replying to threads and they started cooing. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, everyone's just like, what, what is going on right now? Is the internet just going mad? People are waking up, like, Labasco being like, what the hell did I just miss? Uh, and it was basically to announce a new apparel partnership, uh, that they have going between the Overwatch League and Staple Pigeon. Now, I'll be honest, I, I knew absolutely nothing about this clothing brand, uh, I until I looked further into it, so... Uh, of course, you know, this past season, there was a lot of community outcry from the merchandise, and a lot of that was because of Fanatics and the gear that they had. Uh, and, you know, they're trying to basically bring the hype back from merchandise with this streetwear brand uh, for Staple Pigeon. Now, basically what this is, is we are getting some new jersey designs. Uh, so a lot of them featured, like, a colored stripe across the front. Uh, along with the embedded team name as well as the logo on the shoulders. And I do know that John Spector noted that the player names will be added to the front side of the jerseys, and the merchandise is going to drop for pre-order on January 28th. So along with new jerseys, uh, which will be available not only in short sleeve but also long-sleeved uh, variations, we are getting new jackets, we got new compression sleeves, hats, beanies, uh, and some other goodies all along the way. Uh, so these will essentially be the new player jerseys that, you know, we will see the players wearing on stage. Now, I will note, like, we have seen previews of some of the merchandise. Uh, a lot of that being done from the various team Twitters. So I want to get your guys' thoughts on first impressions and what you like about these and maybe try to compare them to what was already available. Uh, cause I know like a lot of people have had different experiences with fanatics. Uh, and also like into the AM in the past is that was a Jersey provider in season one. Then I moved to fanatics and then we had the uproar, all of that good stuff. So Adora, like, what are you thinking about the new look for the overwatch league? Um, I think it looks great. Uh, I'm pretty sure that it is actually a third kick jersey. Um, they don't have numbers or their names on them. Um, I'm pretty sure I saw it in an article earlier. It did say third kit. Um, so I do think they're gonna see some games with this. I don't. I'm I, I'm not guaranteeing that it's not like their main thing. But if they don't have the jersey numbers or jersey names, I'm not gonna call it the main thing yet. Um, mm. But with that being said. Long sleeve jersey sounds hype. Um, I hope that they can wear these pants. I hope they can wear the hats on stage. I hope they can wear anything they they could like really want to on stage. I think it's going to bring a lot of uh, style to the Overwatch League that wasn't there before. 
I'm getting the long sleeve jersey if if it kills me or not. Uh, that long sleeve gladiator jersey on um <laughs> on Space's luscious hair and and head and, and body was just like it, it sold me. Um, I'm super excited to see this. I think it looks clean. I think I could wear this outside without being like this is obviously a um a sports jersey or whatever. It just could like could be more casual in a way. I I enjoy it a lot. One thing I'm curious about is the price points they're going to have because when they first come out with some of the Overwatch League jerseys last year, it just wasn't affordable. I, I'm more of a hat guy. I, I, I like to, to get a, collect all the hats. I got most of the Outlaws hats. So I'm looking forward to seeing what those look like. I think that this basic design is like a, it's a good idea. It kind of brings up the topic of whether or not it's imperative for esports to be mirroring regular sports with like the jerseys and stuff and there's really not a need for that so going towards just like a regular style thing it's a uh, i think it's kind of a good idea from the league instead of putting themselves in that box of wanting to rip off like football and basketball jerseys so moving forward with like a fashion brand like I'm not uh, real knowledgeable about fashion. I've never really heard of this company or anything, but you know the jerseys look cool, and I think it's a good idea to take a step away from that ripping off of the basketball and football jerseys, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, maybe that was ESPN notifying me about your comments because uh, I don't have my phone muted, so I apologize if you hear my ESPN <laughs> sounder. Uh, it's not within reach uh, on that point, but I, I will say, like initially when I saw this, I was like, Okay, these don't look too bad, but the big thing is going to be the price point. Because when we look at the jerseys that were available, you were basically starting at like 60 bucks and going all the way up to like $100 in regards to uh, player jerseys that have, you know, the names and the numbers as well. Uh, so we'll see whether or not they will be able to rush all of this stuff out ahead of opening week since it is only a couple weeks out. Because, you know, it comes out the 28th. Uh, and then that next weekend, we have uh, the opening weekend. So it's going to be a pretty tight window for them to get all of that out. Hopefully, they won't have any issues on that front. Uh, but it does seem like, for the most part, the community's already really embraced the new look, the new designs. Uh, so, you know, hopefully this is going to be a partnership that really works out in the long run and, uh, you know, throws more money at the Overwatch League on that end. Uh, so, that's pretty much it in regards to merch news. Uh, we do have some other cosmetics that we do, do need to talk about. Uh, some of them are new skins. The others are new sprays, which you can get by attending Overwatch League games. So, the way that they are going to do this is if you attend a game. And I say attend. Like, you can't just buy a ticket and get a code. If you attend a game, they are going to be handing out codes to people there. Uh, and, you know, it's like a digital code. You put it on your Battle.net account, basically, to redeem the code, and then you get the sprays in-game. And basically, they have two different batches, uh, and each one is going to have 10 teams included with the batch. So if you attend, you will get basically one of these two batches, and it will be based on whoever the home team is. Uh, so I'm not going to, like, name out all the teams, because that would be kind of pointless. So there's two different batches in total. Uh, so it should be fairly easy to acquire one, if not both, if you do, uh, or if you are looking to travel this season. Uh, but, you know, we didn't really see a ton of previews in regards to these sprays, but, you know, we, we always talk about, like, wanting to get, like, more, uh, you know, like, extra incentives to attend games. Like, yes, meeting the players and everything, and then they're like, oh, here's a couple of, like, team sprays. Uh, that they are trying to, like, kind of theme off of uh, whoever, like, the, the home team is. Now, I don't know if that means, like, each one is going to be individualistic in the sense that, you know, New York will be New York-themed and have, like, a subway or something, and then maybe Shanghai it will be more of a... I, I don't know. But obviously, they would try to incorporate whatever the region is on that front, but, like... Is earning a spray, like, really that much incentive to you guys as, like, a bonus for attending the game? Or would you rather see something else to kind of, like, commemorate your stay there? 
Um, the first thing I'm going to do with that spray is probably probably sell it to someone who wants it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of sprays. Uh, I know there's some people who really like collecting them, but it's just it's not for me. Uh, I'd rather just have a good time while I'm there. Uh, it is a nice incentive. Uh, it's like it's kind of it's like that's sweet, you know. It's like it's not like I'm gonna enjoy it, but it's just like thanks. It's like when your your grandma brings you a cookie and you're like, thanks, grandma. Like, thank you so much. It just I, I'm not a big fan of sprays. Uh, in the in the long run, I think it's cool. I think the spray design's cool. Um, I think it's kind of cool bringing in more Overwatch League into the game, but it's it's just not for me personally. Yeah, I don't think it's something that would at all convince somebody to be like the tipping point to make them go to a homestand. Mm -hmm. But I will say that that's like a straight flex in game. You know, you're going to be standing in the spawn, getting ready to go spray. Your whole team goes, oh, dude, you went to Overwatch League? What? That's so cool. Like, it, it's a, a good way to start conversations with people about Overwatch League and to just like have something that like other people can't have in game is kind of cool so by no means is it like a huge incentive but when you start seeing them popping up throughout the season in your games it's going to be like oh man that's kind of cool that really does have like there really are like a lot of people going to that and gonna be in you know you know you'll know who in your game has been to overwatch league events and that's just kind of cool well i guess for uh, me like it's more like what would you get more use out of like a spray or like say you attend like a shock home send and you get like five skin codes you know oh yeah that that too yeah well they could do both to be honest like or I even any reason not to yeah even like unique skins you can only get from going to events stuff like it just kind of opens the door for them to do more things you know they're doing sprays now it's no problem for them to add voice lines and highlight intros and just the whole list of stuff you get from loot boxes they can start doing giving that kind of stuff out at the home stands and it's just cool it doesn't really cost them anything other than getting it made so you know it doesn't it, there's not like a loss for doing that so it just seems like a good idea to do so I guess my real question is, at the end of the day, is the Boston one just going to be a dumpster fire? <laughs> and I only say that because I know Mental is here. <laughs> would it be a... What, would it that be... Boston would be the dumpster fire? Oh, I mean, it's definitely not going to be London. Going back to <laughs> the Lord bit. <laughs> I think it'd be cool to have a dumpster fire just for the jokes. One of the teams. And maybe, if anything, maybe it would be for cool. Dallas. Oh, it'd be yeah. hilarious if they did it for the shock. <laughs> just <laughs> like the opposite. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see what, what they tie in <laughs> uh, on, on that end. I just, I just want to see like what more of them look like because it's really hard to base like how they're all going to look off of just the preview that we saw since they really only yeah. showed two. Yeah, I was uh, going to say, I only saw the two. Right. Uh, but anyways, something that we have actually seen more of, which we can actually talk about, one, because it is readily available to you in-game right now, are some new Overwatch League skins that have uh, recently gone to live servers, and that is featuring, you know, the three teams that opted to change their colors. So you got the Florida Mayhem, the San Francisco Shock, as well as the Los Angeles Valiant, or, you know, the Wind Zeros in this case. Uh, so... These are available to purchase in-game. So you got Mayhem, uh, no longer red and yellow. They went to a pink and blue look. Uh, with black, you know, they say that black is the accent color, even though it's the dominant color in the skins. I don't know why people keep calling it the accent in that in that case. Uh, we have the Valiant, who moved away from that green and yellow and went to more of a baby blue and yellow uh, color scheme, very reminiscent of what you would see for, like, UCLA. And then you have the shock ditching the origin white in favor of black and silver uh, in reference to the Oakland Raiders uh, who are no longer in Oakland and are going to be playing in Las Vegas. Uh, so I, I don't know how I feel about that, but, you know, I guess they've been true to that area for quite some time. So I guess I can kind of see it. Uh, so basically, guys, what this means is if you were looking for the original variations of these skins, 
you cannot get them anymore. They are not obtainable at this point. So if you have them, great. If you're looking for them, uh, you're SOL, unfortunately. So, no, I have to say everyone is really hyped about the Mayhem colors, right? With the, with the Vice looks. I'll be honest, I do not like the skins. I think black being the dominant color really kind of threw off the balance of the skins for me, and I, I'm not really digging it. I think that if they didn't go with the black being the dominant color, then they risk being too close to the spark skins. And I think that that kind of is like a good differentiator. You know, the pink and blue, it's kind of weird that they chose... You know, they're different shades of pink and blue, but it's mm -hmm. really similar to what the Spark already did. So I think by making the black almost the main part, it kind of, you know, differentiates it. And I think it's a good idea. I like the the Mayhem ones. I think the Valiant ones are, you know, the, the bottom of these three new sets. Mm -hmm. But what they had before was so bad that anything else is an improvement. So is this an good... improvement? I think so. I think that the, the, the minority yellow was like awful. No, like they're still bottom tier blue and gold still at the bottom. But it's just I don't know. I thought the green and yellow was really bad. And the shock ones, they kind of they're, they're pretty basic. I don't know. I don't I, I don't know why they really went to to change too much. They still kept the orange for accents mm. and yeah, I think. Uh, that, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, for me, I like the mayhem better than the the spark. I don't like the bubblegum light blue kind of deal that Spark has. Uh, I've never really liked it. The bubblegum pink and blue, I just, it's never been about me. I like the black. It's just, I think it it contradicts it enough to make it look like it's not as like, I don't know, like kidsy for me at least. Um, Shocks dope. Valiant. Um, they went with the college colors because it looked like collegiate team. Um, <laughs> But other than that, like, I think for, for Mayhem, I think the rebranding for them is huge. Uh, I think McDonald's was not the best move for them, and I think this might be better. Um, but I think the Shock, I, either way, like, the old Shock, I like them as well. But this is just, like, it's it's the gamer black color. It's like, I'm a gamer, look at me. I look badass in game. Um, but other than that, like, it's, I think they're all, like, solid I like the Valiant Four Screen. I think it was different from other teams. Um, as much as I hate Valiant, I think I, I think it was different. Now they're just Boston, but lighter. Uh, but other than that, like I think they're just nice. Uh, I hope I hope the branding can go further with these instead of what they had previously. Well, were they trying to mirror Boston because they figure that they're going to be at the bottom of the rankings with them? That's exactly what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they got to be side by side. So you know, they're trying to. Uh... Be deceptive on that front, so you can't tell them apart. Uh, in that end, uh, but anyways, you know, speak, speaking of the Valiant, uh, we do have a recent addition to the LA Valiant. <laughs> I, I know, mental. I joke because I know you're here. Uh, so the Valiant added a new DPS to their rotation, and they have turned to a lot rumored player on this team. That being none other than KSP, who was getting picked up from the uh, former XL2 Academy. Uh, so we have played with them in Contenders 2019 Season 2. Uh, and of course, you know, XL2 Academy disbanded because they dropped out of Contenders, and uh, KSP became a free agent at that point. So if you're wanting to know what KSP plays, he is primarily known as a hitscan player, more prominent on the Widow, but he does have a pretty mean Hanzo as well. Uh, and he has played for the United Kingdom World Cup team here in uh, both 2018 as well as 2019. And, you know, this signing in particular brings a Valiant up to 10 players, four of which are DPS. So you got KSP, you got KSF, Apply and checks as your DPS line. And, you know, like a lot of people are probably like, well, KSF kind of covers a lot of these, you know, roles already. So what is this going to mean for uh, who is going to be approaching which heroes on this team? And, you know, like, just seeing, like, what we've seen from KSF and Apply in the, in the past, I would imagine that probably means they'll be moving more towards, like, a flex option for this team. 
Uh, but you know, there's been a lot of a lot of hype kind of like built up uh, with these recent XL2 Academy editions. Because, uh, you know, initially we had Gig, now we have KSP. And I know, like, a lot of us are try just trying to figure out, like, how low of a budget did the Valiant have? And whether or not any, you know, new additions to this team will bring them up. So now that we have, like, the fuller picture, like, is it time to start to reevaluate where we would put the Valiant? Uh, knowing, you know more prominent sign-ins here as of late for this team? Uh, I don't think signing KSP brings them up very much in power rankings. He is a pretty good player. He played pretty good at World Cup, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's going to be game-changer for this team. You know, adding KSP, if, if you brought him up a rank, they're still going to be bottom five in most power rankings so you know it's you know a good signing for the valiant but they need a lot more than you know another dps that played good at world cup that's that that's not the what was going to bring their team way up so yeah it's a good signing they're going to have to do a lot more to like really bring their team into contention to like win games but, you know, it's a good signing. It's good that he's going to get a chance in the Overwatch League, especially after he was on a t he was on XL2 after they collapsed. And, you know, kind of gives him a chance to join the Overwatch League. And I, I think that it'll be good, good for him. Well, he definitely wasn't going to join with uh, New York <laughs> with that roster. Yeah. I don't know. Right. There's a slot for him on New York. Uh, for me, I think KSP was perfect for this team. Um, coming from XL2 disbanded, he's not going to have a buyout, which means he's probably cheaper than most players you can get, and you can probably give him a higher sal salary because of it. Um, I think adding him with Gig, who's played with him before, is huge. Uh, my main problem with this is DPS is not their issue. I think the only person you can have a problem with on this DPS line is Apply, but uh, everyone else is just... it's. It's a clean DPS line. I think it's the best part about Valiant by far. And they just brought it up with KSP. Um, the way I normally rank people is like what I want them on my team. I would love to have KSP on the Gladiators. Um, the fact he's on Valiant kind of kind of hurts, but I think he's going to kill it there. And um, if if he wants to move somewhere else afterwards, I think he's going to be able to do it. Um, with that being said, KSF's definitely moving to the flex position. Um, I don't see him playing hit scan. If KSP can play whatever position is better, but I can see him going over KSP in some other spots as well. Um, I can see him flip flop or even play together um, with Shax also kind of flexing wherever he needs to be. I, I just really hope it's KSF and KSP just to uh, infuriate the casters and the analysts. At a certain point, they just got to become P and F. Mm -hmm. it just drop the KS because that's a. Uh... That's a that's a, a lot of tongue twister going on, especially for casters that are trying to go fast. Yeah, there's that that's a you know problem waiting to happen <laughs> for tongue twisters. Yeah, well, I mean they already had some of their players meme in that they were gonna rename to like KSM for McGravy. <laughs> <laughs> so. Or they're gonna side KSA from mm -hmm. contenders. Mm -hmm. That'd be perfect. Uh so they're not the only team who made moves, and uh, I know this is a team that we had already ranked. Uh, in the bottom half. So let's talk about what the Train Do Hunters have been up to, because we finally got some announcements from them. So for starters, and this is going to be the obvious one, Leave was picked up. We knew it had happened. He was already on a contract, but as a streamer, we knew that when he turned 18, he would be picked up by the team, and sure enough, he is one of the new DPS additions. Uh, but that is not it. We also have Atene, Molly, and Lainsa. Uh, and all of these players come from, uh, who were their academy team in LGE Hiwa. Uh, so it's important to note, like, Atene never actually played with that team. Uh, prior to that, he was competing in Contender Specific on Hong Kong Attitude, which was a championship team in the last season of 2018. So you have Motley and Lainsa, who were really, like, a long-time support 
partners, and that goes back to, like, Lingon Esports. Uh, and eventually, you know, they synced up with LG Ihiwa, and they won both seasons of Contenders China. Uh, and, you know, that kind of, like, brought them to, you know, the Pacific Showdown. They also qualified for the Gauntlet because they were a championship team. Uh, unfortunately, though, uh, China didn't do so hot in interregional competition. They did not secure a single win at the Showdown or at the Gauntlet. Uh, so that was unfortunate. And then outside of that, we do know that uh, the Hunters picked up their academy head coach in... Uh, I don't even know if I should pronounce his name. Uh, Dokebai? I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, so he came from LGE Hiwa. He is going to be co-head coaching with Ray. And then we have Gary transitioning from a player position on this team uh, to now being an assistant coach. So obviously, like, one of the big things in the offseason was knowing that RUI, the head coach of the Hunters, was stepping down uh, and retiring from coaching due to health issues, which is something that he had dealt with in the past. And a lot of people were, like, freaking out over whether or not uh, him being, like, the brains of the strats behind the Hunters was going to be a giant blow to this team. But, you know, we've seen, you know, the addition of Leave. We've seen him, you know, as we've mentioned, like... Every Pretty much every week, like, this is someone that has played 20-plus heroes at World Cup. He can unlock a lot of potential on this lineup, and now we have the comfort of a very good part of the core roster from their academy team, who won championships, nonetheless, in their region. So, you know, the Hunters, for us, like, we were we were kind of looking at them, and we're like, well, this, is, this team still has that upset potential. But it's a matter of, are they a 500 team? Are they a play-in team? Where are they going to fall? But now that we see the big picture, how are you guys feeling about Shane Du? Like, do you feel like they are uh, moving up now? Or do you feel like they're kind of going to be stagnant with these signings? For me, the Hunters, uh, I believe they're just going to be the Hunters. As unpredictable as ever. I don't... <laughs> I for, for the coaching staff, it's unknown for me. I, I don't follow Chinese con contenders. I'm glad they got m new supports. Um, I'm glad Gary's still on the team because that's a funny name. Um, stuff like that. It's just like, at the end of the day, I can't wait to see them play. That's mm -hmm. at, at, just like where I'm at with them. It's like, I just want to see how good they are. Uh, they, they showed well in the... In the Shanghai, um, whatever the the trophy the match, whatever, invitational. The, Masters inv inv Invitational. But other than that, like I, there's not much to know about this team other than that the fact that they are Chengdu Hunters and they're gonna do whatever they want when they want it. So uh, I'm just gonna be excited to see them mostly. Yeah, I think that the Hunters are probably gonna move up a little bit from where they were last year, and. It's good to see them add another tank because, uh, or another main tank. It's good to see that because Aiming, while he's got the best wrecking ball stats in the, the, the league, it's good to have another tank player just to fill in some of his, um, the voids where his hero pool lacks. Mm -hmm. um, the support line, they were not outstanding last year. So to bring in some competition for that and or maybe even new starters, it, it looks to be all good moves. And, you know, we've been hearing about leave since the end of last season. So is he going to live up to the hype or have we been talking about him so long that the hype's built up past him? It's uh, kind of all things to wait to be seen. Like, I think that even people that aren't, hunters fans are all gonna love to watch the hunters this year just like last year because mm -hmm. it's gonna i think that the hunters is a good target for what the overwatch league could be where different teams have individual identities based on the comps that they like to play you know you say shang do hunters and people instantly think wrecking ball and i think that that's a really really good aspect for the team that they have an identity and i also think that the meta is gonna really play in to their ability to succeed especially with knowing that they love to play the ball and if a wrecking ball style meta is gonna be in the league this year i would definitely look for the hunters to be near the top of it so 
in conclusion, hunters definitely want to watch them moving into the season. Well, I don't want to speculate too much on this, but uh, there are rumblings that in a couple of weeks, there's supposed to be a huge update for Overwatch. And a lot of people are thinking that hero bands are coming to the game. Now, we saw 222 get implemented in the Overwatch League before it came to live servers. So there is an outside change uh, that, you know, should hero bands come to the game, they might actually go live with the Overwatch League this season. So we might see some drastic changes to uh, map metas and just metas in particular. But, you know, we're going to kind of wait and see whether or not that's actually going to happen before we go too far into detail on that front. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people have been wanting it, kind of like, you know, the implementation of 2-2-2. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people, just like with Roloc, will kind of look at this as a band-aid fix to uh, them not being able to find a perfect balance. Even though I don't think that's even obtainable for any game at this point. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see on that front. But, you know, as always, we'll be looking for our two train duo games just because they are so off-kilter. They're really, like, the only team in the league that has... A defined style that can just throw anyone off. Like, there's really no other team that does that. And, you know, a lot of that does come from the fact that, you know, they are mostly from China, and China has always kind of had their own meta. And, you know, the Pacific has always been very aggressive and in your face. Uh, so we'll see whether or not we start to see divisional or regional metas start to form over the course of the season or whether or not it will be a ton of, like, mirrored compositions uh, on that end. But, you know, tonight, our main focus is, of course, on our power rankings. And again, like, over the past couple of weeks, all three of us have been doing our individual ranks. Uh, we are going to aggregate rankings between all of the hosts on the Overwatch League network. Uh, so we'll be releasing those closer towards the start of the season. And, of course, we are asking our community as well. Uh, we do have a spot on our Discord server for you guys to post your rankings as well, and we'll add them in uh, to the averages as well. But tonight, we'll be going over the teams that we have in the top 10 and going from rank 10 all the way through rank 6. Now, I, again, don't know what these two have uh, in regards to 10 through 6, or really beyond that as well uh so we might not have as much variation just looking at what our you know our 11 through 20 was uh maybe like one or two teams difference uh in that regard because there was one team in particular uh booger who definitely had probably the the largest differential between the other ranks and that was for your fusion rank uh who i will not be covering tonight spoilers uh, so, Booger, I want you to start tonight, so start us off with who you have at the 10th slot. You're muted. Got it. In number 10, <laughs> I have the Houston Outlaws. Um, I think that through the offseason, they made all the changes that they needed to make to improve. So, I think that we're going to see a much better Outlaws than any of the years past. I know y'all had them all a little bit lower. A little bit. But yeah. Not much. But I also think that seeing the moves they've made, at first, you know, picking up Blase and Hydration, I was just kind of confused what the heck they were doing. But then they cleared up all their other weak points. And it not only gives me faith in the team, but it shows to me that they have some sort of leadership coaching management that is on the ball with the goal to improve this team and i think that they're doing a good job doing that um i know y'all already talked about the outlaws but mm -hmm. who do y'all have at 10. Uh, for me i have the bubblegum team themselves the han Jiao spark um i have them this is gonna be surprising i've never been high on the spark uh when it comes to this league, um, they come into this new season with like little or no changes to their team, um, maintaining the DPS Adora, Godsby, Bazi, 
all the bodies on like a two way. Um, it's a decent DPS trio. I've never been high on these guys. Um, I think they might need like another star on this role before I really believe in them. I think they were gonna have that with Crystal, but with what happened with Crystal, I really didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, they just and they they didn't they didn't patch that this off season. They just left it be. Um, Crystal's still on the roster, which is surprising. Um, they also have Sassin, but uh, I really don't know what he's what he's supposed to do on this team since he's like a, a flex between tank and DPS, and that's like he'd be, not he'd really be off tanking. He was signed as an off tank. Is he is he still he's still on flex on most of the things. So mm-hmm. um, either way, it's he's not gonna get over Rhea. He's not like he's just like a weird spot for the team for me. Um, Gushwe, amazing. Um, Nothing else to be said. Probably <laughs> top three main tank. Insane. Um, Arisa's a little weak, but like, who cares? It's Arisa. Um, Rhea, uh, I think he's a fine off tank. I've never been high on Rhea y- either. Um, I think he performs better than most off tanks. Um, I would like some competition that's not Sassin because I don't think Sassin can really compete with him. Um, their support line is where it gets interesting. With um, they kept Bebe and IDK. Uh, I think that's a solid move. I think they did amazing. Uh, their their first season in the Overwatch League. But they also added Coldest and, and Mika. Uh, Coldest is uh, who I'm really looking at. I think he impressed a lot of people in Chinese contenders from what I've been hearing. Um, I really think he could contest for a Bebe spot um, if if language barriers don't bring them apart. Um, I think they he can at least contest for that. And Mika might join in if if IDK can't catch up with a with a um, Chinese off support as well um so i really think they could like switch that up but i don't know how much it's going to do for the team uh, my main worry for this team is their slow adaption to metas that they've had um i do believe they good they're good i think they they adapt if the meta goes on for longer but um with the way this is looking if they're going to update the game the way they say they're, they're going to looks like there'd be more metas faster and i don't think this team's going to adapt enough to be as good as they were last year yeah, this was the team that was 18 and 10 last year, uh, which was fourth overall in the Overwatch League. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do share some of your concerns. I do have them ranked a little bit higher, uh, so I will talk about them in just a little bit. Uh, on my end, I put the Soul Dynasty. So I, I have my reservations about the Dynasty. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously, you know, the big thing this offseason was... The acquisition of former Spitfire players, you know, between Prophet, Gesture, and most recently, Bedotion. Uh, so, I I feel very conflicted for many reasons. Like, two of my teams basically decided to uh, do the old switcheroo. You know, we, we swapped some players around, both at the Overwatch League level. Also, you know, kind of like at the Academy level to Overwatch League. And I I feel like it was a hard sell for the Dynasty to just get Profit and Gesture. I feel like in order to obtain them, they had to give up a lot. And a lot of this will just stem from the fact that Glisser did end up on London Spitfire, which would have been probably, like, made Dynasty for me probably top six if Glister was paired with Profit on this team. Uh, But instead... You know, we have uh, basically the offload of some of the OGs. So, release, we had Zumba. Jahan went over to the Titans. Jexay is now uh, going to be the in-game leader for the Outlaws. Fleta will be trying to unlock Dean's potential on the Dragons. And then you have Hylie, uh, who is on the Spitfire. So, they kept Michelle and Marvell on the tank line. Illicit and Fitz at DPS, as well as Toby uh, at main support. So, I, I will say, like, I have, like, no qualms with Profit at all. I still consider him to be the best DPS player in the Overwatch League. Uh, there there might be a couple of players that come close in regards to, like, individual impact. Obviously, Sinatra has made a, a great point in that case, as much as I dogged on him in the past. Can't deny the kid's ability. Uh, but... For, for me, like, the big issue with this team is the second DPS option. I, I feel like Fitz kind of had his fair share of solid moments this past season. But Illicit didn't really have too much of an impact. So, I 
I'm a little worried on that regard, but I will say, like, if the casters aren't calling the DPS duo profits, I'm going to be severely disappointed and probably throw my keyboard uh, on that end. Uh, now, I know initially we were like, okay, we got creative at flex support, and when it was creative and Toby, I was like, ugh. I, I don't know where to put this team, and then we got Pedotion, and I was like, okay, that's that's better. I don't expect creative to start over him. But, you know, the, the growing concern that I have is knowing that these players are coming from a system that failed in the long run. And whether or not that, like, how much of this core from the Spitfire had to do with that. Uh, and trying to figure out whether or not those problems are going to move from London over to Seoul. You know, kind of like the grudge in a sense like it's just gonna plague both houses in this case uh now for me like the other side of the coin is well you you got toby obviously last week we talked about toby being the sole survivor and i feel like you know this is a a huge you know we've had a huge change in the guard with a lot of the overwatch ogs now gone or moving down to contenders and you have toby on this roster and it's just like well is that going to be enough? Like, is that veteran experience going to be enough to kind of lift up this support duo? And I, I don't know if he's going to rank up against the other main supports in the league in the current meta, if it is still going to be a lot of, like, bat play. So I, I feel like on that end, like, we're probably seeing a bit of a step down, even though their support play, even last year, I mean, even with Jayhan at times, like, it was very shaky. Uh, for what was one of the most respective support duos in all the league. So I just look at it, and I was like, okay, what's what's going to happen with our tank line? Will Jester come in? Will he start over Marvell? Even though Marvell and Michelle this past season were probably the most consistent part of this team, and you could argue that this was the top five tank duo in the league. And, you know, Jester is great at the Orisa. You know, his uh, his halt combinations are probably one of the best in the league. But outside of that, would you guys rate him over Marvell? I'm kind of torn with how good Marvell has looked in the past. So I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm hoping for the best, but I'm worried that we are just going to be Spitfire 1.1 and not Spitfire 2.0 as an upgrade. I'm kind of shocked that you have uh, a soul this low, to be honest. I th uh, it seems like you might have been burned by them before, maybe? <laughs> well, this is also a team that was barely above 500. <laughs> that is true. And I guess the, the question is, is the problems they had at London going to follow them to Seoul? Or was Seoul able to snipe? just the best parts of london mm -hmm. and leave the problems behind and you know that's kind of a question we'll have to wait till the season starts to see um i have sold a little bit a little bit uh higher than you but um for me my main thing is i've heard some rumors about fitz actually doing really good and and uh this scrim bucks of course but like <laughs> i'm still believing that fitz is looking pretty good um i hope he can he can come up and bring it in um i do have the concerns on support line as well uh my main thing i think with them was um they definitely aren't the strongest this year but uh i really think that they have the consistent players that profit gesture probably play Rissa or maybe uh winston for them um could really could really bring this team to some wins that they wouldn't have had last year well, this is a team that went 15 and 13, so do you guys think they go over or under that at this point? I would say slightly over or maybe even close to the same. For me, it's the same. That's um, just I, I think, actually, now the more I think about it, I think they'll do over. They'll, they'll do better than that. I don't know. I think with where I have them, I have them at 14 and 14. Uh, top 10 last season, looking at the rankings, uh, was 15 and 13. What's the cutoff point? Yeah, I could see them going either way. Um, the only reason I have them higher is just because I've heard a lot of good things about Fitz. And that's that's like one of the things I was really worried about was the Fitz and Illicit. And if one of them's doing well, I'm going to put them a little bit higher than where I was before. Even if that's so many higher spots than you, you know? Mm-hmm. 
So I'm expecting there to be a lot of, like, maybe one or two rank differential here for a lot of these teams. Uh, so, Winner, why don't you go ahead and kick off with who you have at number nine for us? Uh, my number nine is uh, Guangzhou Chart. Um, there's reasons I think this team could be really good. I really think this team could be great. Um, I think the DPS duo and Happy and Nero with Eileen on flex is, like, a solid solid dps i guess trio now that i just said three uh although uh this is a, a great duo i don't expect them to play everything one of the weakest points of this team for me is the lack of flexibility between nero and eileen when they're in together i think that's the main reason why they got out of play-ins last year against soul was that as soon as they saw that nero and eileen were together they just played a hit scan to cancel one of them out and i don't think they could they they could keep up with each other on hit scan um their tank line with Rio Krong, I think that's going to be criminally underrated next year. I think Rio, um, he's never been in the limelight, but he's always been more than solid as as a main tank. Krong, um, great in contenders on a O2 Blast. And him coming up to Overwatch League, I really think he's going to make a splash here. Um, he is taking spot of Hoppa, who is highly regarded, just moved to NYXL. So um, if that tells you how good he is, he's on a top team. Uh, I do think this duo will be perform strong together um but if they don't have backups and they don't work it could be a bust i doubt that's going to happen but it, it could be an option um sport line it's all as ever um i think neptuno is going to be a great leader for this team char is a great backup i think he still deserves to be in the league even though he didn't have the best um performance last year uh why I just added got added to the team um, as a flex support. I think he's a Chinese uh, from Chinese contenders. I've heard great things about him. Uh, Shu is just gonna be a Shu. He's he's amazing. Um, the coaches are right. They're, they're fine. I don't I don't I'm not very high on them. I'm not very low on them. Uh, my main concern for this team is uh, during the last year they had one of the longest map losing streaks in in the um, in the season like ever. I think it was over 20 map losing streaks. I forgot if they went over Shanghai's limit or they're like right underneath. But um, 222 might have fixed their issues, but if they had anything to stop them from winning maps like that again, I don't see them going higher than this. Just maybe better off in the playoffs. I actually have the charge at number nine as well. I think they're going to end up performing very similar to last year and their team has quite a few solid players and then they've got players with real pop-off potential like happy nero Shu. we know all of them can pop off so i think that we're definitely going to see you know the charge last year they went 15 13 and I think they'll probably maintain a winning record for this year as well. All right. Uh, I do have the charge here uh, in just a little bit. I have them a little bit higher, though. Uh, in my spot, I have the LA Gladiators, who were probably the team I flipped the most in, in this specific five block. So Gladiators made a ton of changes this offseason. They basically kept their support duo of Shaz and Big Goose. And then they got rid of Roar, who is now in the Justice. Hydration went to the Outlaws. Uh, we got Reaper release. Void is on the Dragons. The K went to Fuel. Surefor went to the Defiant. And of course, they also released Pinker. Uh, so who did they bring on? Well, we got Space from the LA Valiant. OGE from the Fuel. Bird Rain from the Spitfire. Uh, Mir was... Uh, picked up from Uprising Academy, you got Paintbrush from Revival, Bishu from The Charge, also former Gladiator, uh, LH Cloudy from The Eternal, and Jaru from Team Envy. So, man, that's that's a lot of changes, guys. Uh, really, that's kind of the case for both LA teams this offseason, and I, I will say there's a key difference here between the Valiant and the Gladiators. I trust one of these systems <laughs> a lot more than the other. And a lot of that is just due to the fact that here you have a team who has one of the best coaching staffs, uh, who have been one of the more consistent teams across the entirety of the league, have finished in top eight back-to-back -back seasons. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to rate them still fairly highly. But I, I feel like 
this is a lot of changes to incorporate in one season. And I know people have new positions in regards to the coaching staff, even at a higher level than before. And I don't know how that balancing act is going to work between being, uh, was it like GM and head coach? I'm trying to remember how they did it for their head coach, but he was taken over yeah. another role within, you know, the organization. And I, I don't know how that's going to work. So that is a little bit of a concern. But, you know, this is a team who, you know, I, here's my concerns. So you have Bergreen, uh, who basically benched himself in the playoffs. Obviously, that's probably been the thing that's been talked about the most on this team. Like, is Bergreen the number one DPS on this team? I honestly don't know. Uh, if that falls apart, you have two contenders DPS between Mir and Jaru. And Mir would probably be the better DPS option between the two. Uh, but, you know... Keeping the support line intact was a smart move. The front line is looking pretty solid, but I have reservations with OGE because he looked pretty mid-table on the field. And I don't know how much of that was because he was on Dallas versus what his actual skill is. So this is going to be a big opportunity for him. And I feel like the thing that makes me a little bit more at ease about OGE in this case, is I know Space highly regards OGE. There's a lot of mutual respect. And maybe that is going to be enough to kind of, like, bolster up OGE uh, to, you know, try to revigorate him on that front line with him. And we, like, we know what to expect from Space at this point. And it's still crazy to me that, you know, Valiant even let Space go, let alone to the other LA team, you know? <laughs> Who would have thought uh, in that regard? So there's a lot of moving parts on this team, but this team has been super consistent season to season, and I, I feel like they come close to what they were, but I feel like they fall just under that. Now, this is the team that was 17-11 and 11 this past season. That was fifth overall in the league. And I I don't think they're going to fall too much lower than that. There's probably going to be a differential of probably two wins here. It's just a matter of how their DPS is going to be able to do. Because that's really the biggest reservations on this team. If that DPS kind of falters, um, you know, maybe they'll still be hovering around that 7th to 8th rank uh, in regards to the Overwatch League. And maybe they'll pull like a Hanjo Spark and... Maybe they'll still be consistently good throughout the season, but who knows? They kind of, like, they looked a lot better in 3-3, and then 2-2-2 came out, and then the spark kind of downgraded a bit. So, hopefully these contenders uh, DPS can come into the league and really start to pop off, because that's really the one spot on this team that a lot of people are looking at and being like, okay, how are these guys going to be able to do? But we've seen how good these tank lines can open up and create the space for them. So, you know, that might be enough to kind of, like, offset whatever shakiness might be on that particular lineup for them. So, uh, I'll talk about the Gladiators for a second, because I only have them a rank higher. Uh, I do want to talk about uh, my boy Mir. I think he's going to be is going to be the star for this team if, if Bird Ring just doesn't show off the way we want him to. Um, I think he could be a potential... Um, in the running for rookie of the year this guy is feast of famine with his ults with the way he plays he's gonna make a huge play or he's gonna die so he's um, agilities he's no but he's not uh it's crazy uh agilities is different this guy he will command the team to what he what he wants to do um he will take command which i think they didn't have on the team beforehand um i know he chose gladiators because you wanted to play with shaz big goose um i think they already had space and and um og at that time he saw that and he wanted to play with the team um i don't think it was his only option which is it's, it's a good thing especially how late they were um trying out players at the time i think jar was gonna be fine oge i believe under the system might still burn out but they still have lh cloudy in the back line that they added on who will play a serviceable tank if OG ever needs to back out. Uh, with that being said, it still might not go as well as planned. Um, Bishu is just a good good role team. I think another person we need to talk about is uh, Paintbrush, who got added to this team. I think he's a very, very good person to have on any team. I think he's very high motivational. Um, I, I like him a lot. I think he could actually contest 
uh, Big Goose in some positions that uh, Big Goose might be a little bit weaker in. I don't, I'm not saying that he will win out in those positions, but I think he can at least contest and give him some competition. Um, I really do believe that it's uh, it's going to be based on the coaching staff. If they can handle Birdring and OGE, this team could be a top four for me, but I just have them lower because it could really just fall flat as well. Okay. But who did you have at nine? Oh, I have the charge at nine. Okay. I was just yeah. making sure. All right. So uh, why don't you go ahead and kick off with uh, number eight here? Number eight, I have the Hangzhou Spark. We talked about them a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Godsby is a phenomenal DPS player and has like high level pop off potential. You know, you know, nobody says that Gushui is a bad tank, so they're solid there. And I think their support line is pretty stacked. So I think that we're gonna see a Hangzhou spark, maybe not to be the same level that they were last year but i definitely do think that they pull out most likely will pull out a winning record so i've got the spark there at eight yeah i uh, i also have the spark at number eight and you know like i i know they haven't officially said that crystal is gone but i don't i don't think he's coming back like there's no there's no way that they're gonna bring the problem child back regardless of how good this kid is it's just not worth uh, the amount of hassle that he introduces into this team. And, of course, there's, like, legal things going on with all that happening that they haven't really brushed up on too much here as of late. Now, they did turn to their academy support line of Coldis and Mika. Uh, and, you know, for those that are familiar with Coldis, he's basically the Chinese Jonak. That's what everyone dubs him. And I would rate his Zenyatta higher than babies but you know and there mentioned like you know there is a bit of a language barrier here and you know will he be able to catch up on that front resulting in Bebe, uh you know maintaining his starting position we we don't know yet uh but you know if coldest comes in i would not be surprised to see mika subbed in as well so you get that support duo back together that way you can at least have both of your supports being able to communicate rather than having uh, you know, intermix signals on that front. Now, you know, DPS last season on this team was probably fairly questionable for a lot of people, yet somehow they ended going 18-10 in fourth place in the league. I don't think they're going to be able to duplicate that. And, you know, I would say Godspeed probably looked above average. Uh, Adora was kind of a hot mess. And I'm like, despite all that, I was like, okay, this is going to be the week. Maybe they'll play Sassin. Maybe they'll bring in, you know, Bozzy. Nope, didn't happen. And I was just like, oh, okay, we're just going to ride this out, huh? But you know what? They still finished fourth, so I can't complain too much on that front. Uh, so I, I, I'm certain, like, this is going to be a team, no matter what, this will be a team that is going to make the play-ins. It's just a matter of... Can the pieces around the DPS duo continue to perform at the level that they have? And I think they can. Like, I didn't really have too many issues on the front line. Uh, you know, their their back line was probably above average. I wouldn't say they were, like, top five or anything. Uh, but both had pop-off moments. And I, I don't think there's a huge differential in play style between IDK and Mika. So even if there was a swap, there wouldn't be too much stylistic changes to the fundamentals of this team. But, you know, if this team is going to break into, like, top five, someone else is going to have to step up outside of Godsby. Because uh, if if the pass is taught us anything, one person cannot just completely, like, turn around the team. Because, uh, you know, no one on this team, I feel like, has that star quality uh, or pop-off potential as, say, like, what Corey was able to do this past season, or what Nero could do at times for the charge. Uh, and, you know, Crystal might have been that guy, uh, but uh, not looking like that's going to be a thing that happens. So I I feel like knowing that these Billy Billy Gaiman players that they promoted, you know, knowing that they scrimmed with the Spark during their playoff run, you know, maybe that gave them time to kind of, like, iron some of these things out already. Uh, so maybe, you know, they already have some systems in place on that front. But I think the Spark are going to do 
okay. Uh, I don't expect them to have the same amount of wins. It's probably going to be a team that I would put 16 and 12, maybe 15 and 13, uh, depending on you know what sort of metas we are going to be seeing. But I, I don't think they're in any danger of falling you know, below top 10 uh, in this case. Uh, and, you know, looking at my list, I uh, I think I have a team that I know you guys already ranked uh, at number seven. Assuming everyone has gone at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was Gladiators and DK we trust, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so at seven, I have the charge, uh, who, you know, again, kept most of their pieces in place. They did add Neptuno, Wea from T1W, as well as Kron. And, you know, I, I know there's a lot of hype on Kron coming into this team from O2 Blessed. And, you know, some people might say that he was overrated. Uh, some people probably put him behind maybe even QOQ for, like, top three. Uh, I wouldn't say he was as good as Hanbin, but I do think he was top three out of Korea on that front. And, you know, for me, when I look at the charge... The Charge have always kind of been this team that looks solid across the lines, and they operate fairly smoothly. But this team strikes me as a gatekeeper. Like, this is a team that has all the potential to be top six. But, you know, for whatever reason, like, there are times when they can challenge the top teams, but longevity-wise, they seem to kind of even out the longer they go into the season. And, you know, they, they kind of had, like, this veteran experience in regards to their bench this past season with Fraggy, with Bishu. Now, neither of them are there. Now they bring in Neptuno, and Neptuno wasn't really heavy on comms with Philadelphia Fusion. So I don't know if he's going to come in and start over Chara. I honestly don't think that's going to be the case. I would imagine he will play that veteran experience on the bench again, so that's what Fraggy did, uh, maybe lead him from that position. And, you know, for for Wea, like, nobody expected Shu to be as good as he was, so, like, even that sign-in I don't really see playing out outside of just being a capable backup on that front. But if this team is going to be able to hit, like, top five... Uh, I, I really feel like their best opportunity to do that is if we do get to see Double Sniper between Happy and Nero. That is best case scenario for this team and really being able to uh, challenge your top teams out there. And I, I will agree with Nero on, on the sense that, you know, Rio is someone that probably doesn't get looked at a lot in regards to being like a top talent at the main tank position. But everything around him brings his level up. Very similar to, like, what we have seen from Super on the Shock. And this team has just been consistent through and through. It's just a matter of, can this team actually make a deep run in the playoffs? And we just quite haven't seen that as of yet. So I want to see them remove that gatekeeper status that they have. All right. Um, I'll talk about my number seven because we've already talked. Soul Dynasty for me. Um, so for me, Soul Dynasty, my main problems is uh, sure they added profit, they added gesture. I think we've already talked about this, and I just think that money wise, they grabbed these two expensive players and then had to compensate for whatever they had previously, so they couldn't bring in players such as you've talked about it, Glister. Um, and they had to sell it to London, and they had to sell all these great players that they had previously to other teams that they were they're building up just to get these two. I don't want to call them legacy players because they're still good, but it's just like a, it's more of like a these are known really good Korean players that could end up busting for them. Mm -hmm. um, I do have them higher than the Gladiators or the other two teams because I think they'll be consistently good. I just don't know how how far they will go from then. Um, I I think their their skill floor is higher than some teams other than their support line, but I think their uh, skill ceiling could be could be lower based on who else they have on their team. Uh, my number seven, I've got the Gladiators. Um, I think that going in, they've got a phenomenal support line and a really good tank line. So 
going you know the their dps is kind of the the question there but i think at the end of the day they're going to be able to pull off a fairly successful season um yeah, I'm very high on Shaz and Big Goose for a support line. I think that that um, they're definitely going to be able to to lead that team. Um, you know, they finished last season 17-11. And I don't know if they have uh, top five potential. They have top five potential, but I don't know if they'll grab top five like they did last year. Um who who do you, did you have for seven totem? Uh well I had I had the charge. Uh and so oh, we're all we're bad. all good at number yeah. seven, so that leaves yeah. us with number six. Uh and you know, this was another team who have like we saw the Shanghai Masters Invitational, right? And I don't want to read too much into that, but what we saw out of this team I was very impressed with. So I'm gonna talk about Shanghai Dragons. Uh I will say like I had them flipped with my number five team quite a bit. Uh, so I, I ended up putting mm -hmm. Dragons in the sixth spot. So during the offseason, they release a couple of players. Uh, they release Yunjin, because he couldn't stay on the payload. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they release Gamzu uh, and his his dog. So he's over on the fuel. Uh, Koma was released, and they just got rid of Envy, who wasn't really playing. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens on that point. Uh, so they kept Izayaki, Dia, Gaguri, Luffy, DM, and Dean. And then they added Flatta from the Dynasty. They reacquired Fearless, who, if I'm not mistaken, was on their academy team. So that was a promotion. Uh, he might have even been two-way, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to double-check on that front. Uh, but they got Stan 1 from the Gladiators Legion. Avoid from the Gladiators, Lip from Blossom, and Lee Jae Gone from Runaway. Now, you know, I look at this team, and I'm, I'm just looking, I was like, man, this team can pop off. Uh, the, the problem is, like, you look at the tank line, and you're like, is this an elite team? Like, I feel like the tank line is the only thing that is holding this team back to really make a further run in the long run. Um, you know, this front line could easily buckle. Uh, Void, I think, played up compared to like what he was in the inaugural season, so he looked better in season two. But how is he gonna do like on a brand new tank line with someone who might not even have a ton of you know Overwatch League experience? That is a big question mark for me on that case, but, you know, we, we've seen really good teams with front lines that we would consider to be below average do exceptionally well. And I think the support staff around this team is going to help strengthen that core up front. And, you know, I, I really like the DPS additions to this team. They picked up Fleta from my dynasty. Uh, you know, like... I wasn't as conflicted with that than them not being able to get Glister. Because Fleta did have a little bit of a downgrade, in my opinion. Uh, Lip looked very good. Lip Fleta together at, you know, these exhibition matches looked great. But again, it was exhibition. Wasn't a real match. Uh, but I, I think with these additions, we can start to see the DPS really start to unfold and cover all of the different bases. Because at the end of the day, you know, we saw this team initially come out running a lot of triple DPS. Then we saw the introduction of Rolllock. They had to move to two DPS. And then all of a sudden, the dragons just kind of fell apart. And a lot of that was because they didn't have that additional threat uh, that they could have used outside of Widow, outside of Pharah. And then, you know, usually they were, like, disrupting with, like, a Wrecking Ball or, you know, some sort of dive on that case. And then they just kind of crapped the bed. And, you know, I feel like losing Gamsu is going to be, a you know, a fairly decent blow to this team. But this is also a team who was still kind of below average. I mean, they finished 11th. They were 13 and 15 this past season. But you start to see, you know, Dean being able to get 
unlocked more, and you can start to see him field other characters. And I feel like they're going to have a lot more combinations. They have a lot more depth at that DPS role in particular. And while I'm not super familiar with Sand One Stay on the Gladiators of Legion, I know at some point before he was signed by them, he had subbed in for Team Envy at the main tank position, and they looked pretty good there. So, I, I feel like he's going to be okay, but if there's going to be one thing to hold them back, it will be the front line. But I feel like the DPS and uh, the support line aren't going to be solid enough to bolster them up to really start to compete. And I'm just excited for this team, because if there's another team outside of the Hunters that are going to do some really off-kilter crap, it's going to be Shanghai. For me, I also had Shanghai Dragons. Uh, my main reason, it was that they were teetering top five, top six for me, just like you. My main reason was the recent news about DM. Um, he He's very sick right now, and he might not be in for know the full details of it, but um, I feel like that could hurt them. Um, and really, they were very even with my top five team to where the point that this was like the one thing I was like, all right, this gives me a reason to put them where they are. Um, I think Void, although he he did really overperform from his previous, I think he can do really well in this team. If uh, Coach Moon, their their coach from Valiant previously, can can ring him in, um, Fearless, I think he looked pretty clean uh, from what I've seen of him from uh, from Contenders China. Um, I think he looked pretty clean. I think he might have been put in this team afterwards after maybe scrimming for with Stan One for a while. Um, not to mention, I still think Stan One could still be a pretty good main tank, but I don't, he's just, these are all a bunch of unknowns for the tank line, like you said. Um, support line, I think Luffy and Izayaki can both, like, you really can't go wrong with either or. I think Izayaki's better mechanically. I think Luffy's a solid all around player. Um, support line, Lee Jae Gong is a huge upgrade. Um, I just like my main concern is if Coach Moon's. Like the problem with Valiant last year when they went 0 and 7 with Coach Moon, if it was a coaching problem more than just like the the mixed roster problem, it could really end up hurting this team more than hurt, like um, helping it. Other than that, I think this team could really pop off next year and be um, a top team. So, who on this team is going to be too smart for the meta to play and will get benched in the first six weeks? Mm. <laughs> We'll see. Guess we'll have to find out. Maybe Void. Fleta. <laughs> that's that's my guess. I actually have someone different at six than y'all. I have Soul Dynasty, um, where I believe y'all might have been a little bit more worried about them bringing the negativity from London's past season. I kind of feel like they picked the high points. I know if they didn't... Fury is considered a very high point of that championship London team, but I think that the three parts, Prophet and Gesture and Bedotion, were great pickups for Soul. Um, I think that we're going to see uh, hopefully a, a return to form from, from uh, Prophet, Gesture, and Bedotion. And I also am not trying to, I think that being stationed in South Korea is going to be big for them. They're going to be more at home and be able, you know, it's not like moving to the other side of the world for an entire season. They're going to have a little bit of home here and there. And I think that that's, that's going to help them a lot. And I think that we're going to see, honestly, I think that we're going to see the best soul that we've seen so far in the Overwatch League. While there is a lot of questions about their second DPS, you know, Fitz, he has potential and it's still not out of the question for a mid-season pickup. So I think that we're going to be able to see a pretty high level dynasty. Yeah, ho hopefully that would be the case, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I've seen a lot of Korean core rosters decide to, uh, not do so hot in the Overwatch League. 
Then again, with how much influx of Korean talent there is, it's more likely to happen than not happen, technically, since, you know, like 60% of the player base is uh, Korean. On that front. Uh, so that will round out our uh, rank 10 through 6. So again, next week we'll have our top 5. Uh, and I, I will say I automatically put Shock at number 1. I feel like mm -hmm. that's probably a safe guess across the three of us. Uh, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely talk more about some of the other teams, and uh, you can probably figure out who we would have in the top five for the most part based off of who we had at ten through number six. So with that being said, guys, I think it's time that we uh, we head out for the night. So if you guys want to help us out, one of the best things to do is to head over to iTunes and write us a review. We do have a new review this week. Uh, that was sent in from MasterGuy6579. And this was a five-star uh, on iTunes. He says, I just recently got back into podcasts, and I'm glad I found this one very knowledgeable, and I love everyone's thoughts on every topic. Uh, so, MasterGuy, thank you so much for reaching out to us. Uh, we are always looking for ways to improve the show. If you guys have any suggestions for us, please let us know. We are open ears at all times. And of course, once we get into the season, our format will get changed around a little bit on that front. So stay tuned for that. Now, if you would like to find additional content, of course, we have our podcast directory on our website. And then every Sunday, we do the weekly recall, which I started to post on uh, the Creative Overwatch Reddit here recently. Uh, so we have every Sunday, the weekly recall, lists all the podcasts from the prior week. So to keep up with the latest on that front, either be in our Discord or follow Recall on Twitter at OW Recall. Now, if you guys would like to support our podcast network, because we do have a number of shows, you can do so a couple of ways. You could throw Twitch Prime subs our way. Otherwise, you can sub at $4.99 a month on Twitch. And then, of course, we have a cheaper option at Patreon at patreon.com slash OWL network where we have tiers starting at just $1 a month. So every little bit helps, and that gets put towards, you know, giveaways. It gets put towards, you know, podcast costs for hosting, all of that good stuff. So if you want to help us out, please do so. And you too could join the likes of our Master and Above patrons in Blazing Bob, Brendan, Jay-Z, Owl, Kesha, and Agent Life in helping our network grow. And of course... Uh, we do have some events coming up, so Anur, I'm going to throw it to you, because we got something coming up in a matter of uh, of days at this point. Yeah, we got a game night coming up. Um, game nights return on Saturday, January 20th. You can join us for a night of custom and workshop games starting at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, we'll likely be hanging out in the game, uh, in the game night lobby prior to then. So if you want to link up for a quick play or other game modes uh, before handle, beforehand feel free to hang out uh match will be streamed on our twitch channel come check us out there come join in have fun yeah i'm stoked for game night but if you want to contact the show you can email us at contact at owlnshow.com our website is owlnshow.com you can find the show's twitter account at OWLN show. We also put all of the stuff from the network onto YouTube at youtube.com slash Overwatch League Network. Uh, the Discord is discord.me slash OWLN show. It's important to note you need to be a part of the Discord for game night. And our Twitch is twitch.tv slash OWLN show. And we are Twitch affiliates, so you can help support the show by subscribing to our channel and own the network emoticons. The podcast network streams regularly with a couple different shows. You got this one, Overwatch League Network, Mondays at 7 p.m. Uh, Overwatch League by the Numbers airs Tuesdays at 6 p.m. And tomorrow, Chris from FantasyOwl.com is going to be the guest uh, Heroes Never Die, a variety of show airs Wednesdays at 5 p.m. And host streams run when available on a flex schedule. So be sure to give the network a follow 
to get notified when we go live. And there is the Patreon is patreon.com slash OWL network. Yeah, and uh, guys, just as a reminder, you know, tomorrow we are talking about daily fantasy <clears throat> Overwatch League. So really looking forward to seeing what uh, Chris, a.k.a. Fowl, has in store for us for his 2.0 launch. Because uh, he's been pretty tight-lipped about it, so who knows what sort of shenanery he's going to have up his sleeves. And again, game night this Saturday at 7 p.m. Pacific time. But if you see us in Discord and voice chat, feel free to hook up with us. We'll probably be starting a lobby earlier or like just running quick play. So if 7 p.m. Pacific time is a little bit too late, maybe hop on a little bit earlier and we could... Uh, do something else while we wait for people to log in on that front. Uh, but with that being said, of course, you can contact all of us over on social media. Uh, Highnoon.gg uh, Mental is run by Soul Drink. Uh, Soul Drink was on the last episode of OWL by the Numbers uh, to talk his 3.0 launch. So you can check that one out uh, either on Podcatchers or on our Twitch page because that was last Tuesday. Uh, so in regards to contacting myself, you can reach me on Twitter at TumblyDrunkCTR. And I do stream Monday, Wednesday, uh, and Thursday on Twitch at twitch.tv slash TumblyDrunk, where you could probably see me either betching Booger on May Tank <laughs> or poking fun at Ramses and his Arisa play, which also happened today. And I actually for forewarned him, Booker, about me potentially benching him, too. <laughs> so <laughs> I put it out there. I was like, is this going to be another case? I don't know. We'll have to wait to see. But uh, I have been playing a ton of competitive. Actually, I actually finished my placements, Booker. I don't know if you saw the message in Saf Launch, but I actually placed Plat on Tank nice. after going 4-1. So I was pretty happy about that. Not so, like, I'm not, I'm not like, down on my other placements because they were, like, 22-23 on the other rolls. But, uh... Regardless, I place on everything, which is more than I can say about really any of the other recent competitive seasons. But I want to know, you know, how our listeners can get a hold of you guys. So I'm going to throw it over to you, how they can reach you over on the social media. You can find me on the Twitter at <laughs> Anura OW. Um, I just spam things on Twitter. So uh, if you want to see your uh, just headline spams with random things about Overwatch League, just hit me up and be fun. And on Twitter, I am Booger Brains, B O O G E R B R A I N Z Z. And from there, you can find links to my Twitch and YouTube. I have a fantasy Overwatch League show called Picking Good Ones with Booger that I do on Fridays. And we just finished up our top tens for each role of fantasy Overwatch League. So I'm really looking forward to keeping that going through the season. Yep, and stay tuned for our aggregate Fantasy Overwatch League rankings, which will be dropping soon between all of the different Fantasy Overwatch League creators out there, including Booker and myself. Uh, so with that being said, guys, I do want to thank you again for joining us tonight on another episode of Overwatch League Network. This has been episode number 110. I've been your host, Tumbley Drunk, joined, as always, by my co-host, Anura and Booker, and we hope to see you guys back tomorrow night when we talk about whatever changes they have in store for us over at fantasyowl.com for daily fantasy Overwatch League. So guys, take care, and you have a good night. <laughs>